Good evening and welcome to St. Peter's. Welcome to Jazz Vespers. It's good to be together this evening for those of you joining us here in person as well as those folks who are joining us via our, our live stream. Jazz has been an important part of St. Peter's life, a, a vital part of St. Peter's life since the mid-1960s. Uh, jazz Vespers takes jazz and prayer and I think all of us and gives us a, a moment in our week uh, to pause and to center ourselves to come together as a community. So whether this is your first time at St. Peter's or if you've been here many times, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, typically, Vesper is a church service uh, that the church has been saying for uh, 2,000 years. Uh, is said really as the sun sets. Uh, time changes don't allow us to really be at the point of when sun sets. But one of the rituals, even though we do this every week at 5 o'clock, is to light a candle in our midst. And so many of the uh, faith traditions light a candle really as, as sun sets, as before you take a moment to pray, uh, to remind us that uh, we are all, of course, here, but so too is God. And so I'll light our, our candle here in the sanctuary. For those of you joining us on our live stream, perhaps in the quiet of your own home, you'll light a candle too. And as I go to the altar to light the one that's here in the sanctuary at home, perhaps you'll say what I'll say here, which is God's light shines, light of life eternal. And then, as the church has done again for centuries, we, we quiet ourselves, we calm our bodies, we allow our minds to slow a bit by reciting a psalm. The psalms are, in a way, a, a sort of a prayer book. They hold so much. They hold joy. They hold sorrow. They hold longing. They hold anxiety. The psalm 141 was written really at the for the close of the day, and you'll hear how the psalmist sort of goes through, in fact, the whole body uh, and saying, in a sense, be still. Join me uh, with Psalm 141. In Middle Eastern societies, you light incense to welcome someone. We don't have incense here, but maybe you can take a breath and hear the psalmist say, let my prayer rise before you as incense, O Lord. The lifting up of my hands as night comes. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly Hear my voice when I cry to you. Set a watch before my mouth. Guard the door of my lips. Let not this heart of mine be inclined to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in the wickedness of evildoers. But instead, O oh Lord, turn my eyes to you. For it is in you that I take refuge. It is in you that I find nothing other than life. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, O Lord, the lifting up of my hands, even as the day is over. Let the incense of our prayer ascend before you, O God, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with hearts stirred to serve our neighbor, we might sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen.
This is a reading from St. Matthew's Gospel. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And those of the household came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. They said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? He replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I would tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into a house and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seeds are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so too it will be at the end of the age." The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen.
I don't know if you're like me when you hear this uh, passage from, Mar or from Matthew's gospel. Uh, whether or not you grew up in a church or, or not, uh, the reality is in the last 40, 50, 60 years in the United States, uh, even people who might be part of no religious tradition at all, the United States has had a tremendous amount of uh, preaching from the perspective of uh, Christian uh, ministers, preachers, who preach very moralistic uh, interpretations of Scripture. And so maybe you heard this text very much in that spirit as sort of a, a moral lesson, and maybe you've identified yourself as a good plant or a weed. I don't know. But that's not the reason Jesus tells the parable. And it's hard to shake that because at least for the last, as I said, 50 or 60 years, and at least in the U.S., uh, this has been such a, a force. Um, but explore with me, if you will, actually Jesus' context, and then I hope that maybe we'll all see a little bit, something a little bit different about this parable. And let me not start with Jesus. Let me start with just about any situation like the one Jesus was, 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 was uh, wrestling with. The, the situation of someone who really isn't in control of what is going on around them. You can think of Af African Americans enslaved in this country, despite what they want to teach us in Florida. You can think of LGBTQ people in the United States in a predominantly 
uh, heteronormative world and, and legislation that's stacked up. You can think about women in this country. Did no right to vote, right? How do you stand up to that kind of system, those kinds of power that are it's aimed at tamping people down? That's what Jesus was facing. In his case, it was an occupied, first century Palestine occupied the, by the mighty Roman Empire. And it wasn't just simply that Rome had come in with their armies and their systems of taxation that, you know, said, hey, open up your wallet and whatever you've got will take that plus everything else. It was also that Jewish people, just like Jesus, uh, in places and positions of authority, those who had positions of authority, people like King Herod, who got sent off to Rome for high school and came back to first century Palestine and said, oh, how can I impress the, how can I impress the oppressors? We're very happy to go along with that system. So if, if, you, if you begin to imagine that worldview, and think of yourself as Jesus, who is after standing up against that, in Greek, the word is not kingdom, the, the word or empire, the, 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 the word is basileia. So Jesus standing up to the basileia of Rome by talking about this basileia, in English, kingdom of God. Could you imagine if he just simply started preaching and said, oh yeah, those Roman uh, soldiers, how long would Jesus have, right? They eventually crucify him. But he would have been cut off immediately. Or, or if he started to talk openly as he did, as his cousin John the Baptizer did, certainly, about King Herod. Remember what happened to, to John the Baptizer. His wife said, hey, <laughs> would like to have his head on a platter for my birthday. So if you're Jesus and you want to travel the countryside and give your people some sense of hope, you have to talk in parables like this. And you have to say, well, well, maybe, maybe this parable is not aimed at judging people, some moralistic uh, way of seeing the, the text. Maybe instead it's a veiled description of what life was like for Jesus and for those living under this occupation. You couldn't help but wake up in the day and have good things that happened and bad things that happened. And if you tried to eradicate some of what, like the, the Roman uh, taxation system, if you tried to take that on, not only would you probably not be successful, but you might actually uh, so disrupt those that have all this power that whatever is going well in your life would also be taken too. Can you start to see how this parable is intended to work when it comes to not some moralistic idea, but really descriptors of power dynamics in first century Palestine, which are really power dynamics in our own world. Dr. King put it this way. He said the arc of justice is long. And he didn't just come up with that on his own. He was studying texts like these and the great wisdom. It's not about accepting things as they are. I want to be clear. It's not about saying, oh, I don't have a voice. It's not about being able to, to stand up or not for what is right. It, it's actually, if you think and you take the text really seriously, they're very clear. This is a good plant. This is a weed. You can call very clearly things as they are. But I think there are two things that are meant to come out of this text that apply to all of us even down today that are not moralistic. The one is, in fact, that ark, right? It's, it's, it's the sense of where this parable is headed. There will be that day, right? There will be the day when there is the harvest, and the good will be harvested, and there will be nothing but good. That's the promise. 
And then the second thing that which, which comes out of it is that those of us who wait for that day, who long for that day, who march for that day, who pray for that day, who work for that day, our work and our labor is not in vain. And, and here's the thing, this is the thing that Jesus, I think, was trying to really teach. We can each work on that individually alone, and we'll have a certain amount of, of sway. But coming together, the power of one person's voice added with another person's voice and another person's voice, the power of that amplification, one person's labor, one person's toil adding with another person's, the power of, of, of that sort of work, that's the real strength of even the most oppressed people rising up, facing power. And here's the thing about power, evil, or however you want to name it. When you, when, you, when you stand up to power with that kind of strength, that strength of community, it can't stand. That is the ultimate witness that Jesus makes. Uh, the Romans even killed him. And the Christian community that formed around him uh, endured beyond the powers of Rome. Same thing, the Jewish community endured beyond the powers of Rome. And that's true for us. Every time we gather, yes, we're all different, we have different perspectives on, on these things, but there is a strength that comes, a special strength actually, that comes when we come at it from our different perspectives, from our different views on life. When we come together in true community like that, Nothing can stop it. So wherever you are on that journey, wherever you are in this great arc that Dr. King speaks about, wherever you're at, no, you're not a weed or a plant. You're a part of something stronger. You're part of this great community of God, the Basileia the, of God, which can stand up to any and all things. Uh, and tonight, especially as we gather with Jazz Vespers for this uh, service of prayer, one way in which we come together is in fact to pray. There's something about praying in a space with one another, our hearts, our minds, our voices even, our ears attuned, that, that can draw us together. That's the power of community. So I invite you now to pray together. I'll offer some words of prayer. The, the band will, will play some things with us. And let our hearts, our minds, our voices, our ears, our, our, our very selves be drawn together in this community uh, as we pray for the church, the city, the world, persons in need. And know that however we pray this night, God hears us. O God, you call your church to announce the gospel of reconciliation and truth. Guide it as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting in your spirit, bearing witness among us. You bring forth all creation and you call it good. Direct policymakers to protect lands and seas Bring rain to sun-parched fields and protect areas impacted by natural disaster and fire. You desire peace among nations and among peoples. Guard our neighborhoods from hatred, 
particularly the Jewish and Muslim communities in New York, and teach us to advocate for those who live in fear. This week, with the World Council of Churches, we pray especially for Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Rwanda. You are gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer any affliction. Sustain your people living with HIV and AIDS and other diseases. Protect shelter, provide shelter for all who are unhoused and release any who are unjustly imprisoned. You give life to your people from age to age. We give you thanks for the witness of our beloved dead, whom we remember in our hearts now. Who with Mary, Mother of God, and all your saints, feast at your eternal banquet.
Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is James Boudreau. I'm the director of programming here at St. Peter's Church. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here in person. Thank you for joining us online. Just want to say a few words of thanks. Um, first, uh, please help me uh, thank these uh, musicians, this very modern and classic sounding trio uh, on drums tonight, Ronan Itzik. Mike McQuirk, Bakes. Jostine Gulbranson, guitar. Um, we do Jazz Vespers every Sunday at five o'clock, and if, you're, if you've been here before or if you watch us online, um, you might feel the way that, that I do, because I'm here quite a bit. And uh, one of the best things about Jazz Vespers is we have these two sections within the prayer service that we've already experienced this evening. One of them is early on in the service when the pastor reads um, the psalm. And the second one is during the prayers, which we just had before this last piece. And each group, um, we, what we do is we invite the musicians to provide some musical accompaniment to that, to the prayer and to the spoken word. And it's different every, every time. So everything is different in that all of the artists play in their own way and, and choose their own repertoire that they're going to play it here. But that's a very special thing because it's interaction between the prayer, between the spoken word, and there's no guidance. Well, we don't provide any guidance on what that should particularly be. So when you're here a lot, or you can go back into our YouTube channel and watch some of those, it would actually be a really cool playlist to actually just clip some of those. I probably don't have the time to do that myself, but we could go in there and take a look at just those because it's gonna be, you'll hear the same or similar words each time, but the music's gonna be entirely different. You get anything from very energetic music, something kind of dissonant, to um, what we heard tonight, which was unusual, and I thought really very special on the last one that started with the drum beat it was a really nice feel for those prayers. And it's not what normally happens during the prayers. Normally during the prayers, it's a little more meditative. There isn't necessarily like a beat going on, but this time we had that and it was really, really good. So uh, that's just one of the things that we, that I enjoy being here at Jazz Vespers and hopefully you enjoy as well. Um, so Next week, we have a special one. Uh, I think all of them are special in some way, but the reason that I say that about next week is we have Emmy Maccabi is gonna be here and she's gonna be our leader. Um, and we also have Thomas Morgan on bass gonna be here next week. And um, uh, Vitor uh, Gonsal uh, uh, Gonsalves is gonna be here and he's gonna be playing that pipe organ. So we very rarely do that at Jazz Vespers, and it's gonna be a very sort of special occasion. So if you can come back or you can catch it online if, you, if you're not gonna be around. But I mean, I think certainly in the last few years, we haven't had that organ played at Jazz Vespers. So, and the, the organ has recently been rebuilt. So it's almost like a brand new instrument, and we're gonna hear a little bit of what that instrument can do next week. So I hope you can join us for that. Lastly, uh, if you value what we do here, as, as Pastor Stoller said, we've been doing this since 1965. We hope to do it long into the future, and we do need support in order to keep doing it. So if you're in a position to be able to offer some financial support, you can do that at stpeters.org, or we have a basket in the back if you wanted to leave a gift there. Um, with all of that said, we have one more piece of music and then a blessing from Pastor Stoller, and I wish you a good rest of your evening. Thank you.
as you go forth from this place this night, go with the blessing of the one who brings light and life to all creation, and especially go forth in peace. Thanks be to God. <laughs>